Shana Tova, everyone. Good evening. It's wonderful uh, for you all to come out for this tonight. I'm Rabbi Dan Moskowitz. For those that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm one of the rabbis here at Temple Shalom. Rabbi Brown is here also. There she is. She'll be roaming around with a microphone later. Um, and uh, we're, we're really honored to be able to provide this program tonight, not only for our congregation, but for the community. Um, I'll just tell you briefly that this was something that we actually had planned in the works for a while, months before Charlottesville ever happened. I got to know Tony, and I'll share a little bit of that with you. And he subsequently spoke to our, uh, after meeting with me, spoke to our high school students, and I decided then, back in last year's school year, in the springtime, that, oh, we need to bring this conversation to the community, particularly for Sichot. And then all that has happened in our world makes it even more prescient and, and more important. So thank you for coming tonight. Just a little bit of context. Slichot is the holiday that um, opens up the doors of repentance for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Slicha means apology or forgiveness. And the prayers that we enter into later tonight, and you don't have to stay for the service, though we'd like you to. <laughs> um, the prayers that we enter into tonight change the modes and the melodies and begin this process of internal reflection so that we can do what's called in, in Hebrew tshuva, the process of, of repair and repentance for our actions towards ourselves, towards God, and towards others. And so in that context, to have a conversation here uh, about our, our topic for tonight is really, I think, a, uh, an opening up of the, the real meaning of tshuva and the real meaning of, of slicha, forgiveness. So I want to welcome uh, Tony McAleer and Dove Barron uh, to our bima. Tony and Dove, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Temple Shalom. So. Um, we're going to have a conversation for half an hour, 45 minutes or so, and then we're going to open it up for questions to all of you. Uh, and Rabbi Brown will walk around with a microphone to do that. So, Tony, you and I first met, um, gosh, it's got to be six or seven months ago now, if not more. Alan Margulies, who's here. Alan, where are you? So, as I remember it, Alan's brother, Teddy, a blessed memory, and, and you worked together. And um, in the context of taking care of Teddy's uh, affairs, uh, you got to know Alan, his brother, who was taking care of his estate. And from that, you requested to meet with, with me. And when that conversation happened before you met, when you were meeting with Alan, Alan called his rabbi. Like, I just met a white supremacist, or a former white supremacist. What do you do? You call your rabbi. Uh, tell me if you could share with, so then we met in my office. Yeah. And share with all of us, if you could, a little bit of your story. Um, tell us about your life before, before this. Well, I spent 15 years from the mid-80s uh, to the mid to late 90s involved in the whole world of white supremacy. I was involved in neo-Nazi groups of quite violent uh, and extreme ideologies, uh, Aryan nations. I was uh, a regular visitor to Idaho, white Aryan resistance. Uh, and I set up a phone line here in Vancouver called the Canadian Liberty Net, which uh, was like a computerized voicemail system that was uh, prosecuted twice under the Canadian Human Rights Act. Um, the people that I spent time with and admired and, and hung around with would be names like Ernst Zundel. My lawyer was Doug Christie. Um, I was involved with Wolfgang Drogi and the, the who's who in the Canadian gallery of, of that scene. Mm. Now, we have some pictures of you from that day, because looking at you right now, one would not have thought. But, but you sent us some pictures uh, of you back in the day uh, in, 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 the, in the white supremacy movement. Do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, this time in your life and some of the things that you were involved in? Well, as you can see, it's, that's not a face filled with joy. Uh, I was a very angry uh, young man. And, uh, you know, there's a sort of expression that I've heard what that would transmit. And uh, some people go down the road of... I think we're losing your microphone. I'm going to switch your batteries real quick. I was prepared for this. <laughs> oh, no, the microphone's fine. We'll just... Uh, well, we'll Maybe just, I'm we'll, not speaking loud. We'll switch it anyways. Talk amongst yourselves for a moment. Well, now I 
broke it. It was going so well, too. We had everything was... No. Oh. Rabbi Brown, can I have that hand mic that you have? Um, so I was this angry young man, and um, you know some people uh, harm themselves. They they transform that anger inwards, and I was one that uh, spewed it out out into the world, and um, and was very anti-Semitic. So when we when we met together, you were telling me a little bit about some of the stuff that you did. Uh, in, in white supremacy, and that was part of the reason why you wanted to come see me as a rabbi, and particularly a rabbi at this congregation. Why, why was that? What? Well, in, in this journey that I've gone through, um, and I looked at, I've, I've spoken at the Museum of Tolerance in L.A., I've spoken to Jewish communities in different areas, but I've never spoken to this one. And, you know, and I started asking myself, why is that? Why in my own backyard is, is, is that conversation conspicuously absent? And I think it's, it's easy to talk. It's safe to talk over there. You know, that someone in Orlando doesn't, you know, haven't, there's no personal connection to the pain or the damage that I had caused. And um, I think part of it is fear for, on my part, shame. I certainly carry a lot of shame because here it's real. Here it's personal. I mean, you, you did things in this Vancouver community. This is, was your base of operations. What? This synagogue is, is ground zero because the very first anti-Semitic act I did was to place a National Front sticker on that front door. Really? Wow. It's come full circle right back to here. I'm just letting that sink in for a moment. <laughs> so, at some point, you, you met Dove. Uh, either one of you, tell us about that, uh, that encounter. And because you were, you, you were in the movement, you were, you, were, you were involved and engaged in all these activities. I'm not sure even before we get to the Dove part, if you can just tell us a little bit more about some of the stuff that you did so we really understand. Right, so... The way that I harmed the Jewish community um, wasn't through vandalism. You know, that was, I think, the only act of vandalism that I did. It wasn't through violence. Most of the people that we beat up were white people that, that opposed us. I think most of the damage that I did was through the propaganda, through the words, and it was a psychological. It was a psychological warfare that... that um, I imposed here, and I think um, what we consciously were attacking, what I consciously was attacking, was your sense of safety. Mm. You know, in the context of, of sins within the Jewish people, the sin of Lashon Hara, of, of hate and evil speech, is, is, is one of the greatest, maybe even greater than that of physical violence because that type of sin keeps injuring over and over again. And as you say, the, the removal of safety, the sense that just as you can squash out you know, one vicious attack, you know, a verbal attack or one accusation or you know, false claim and, and, and whatever, then the other one pops up because somebody heard it and you can go around chasing it all around and you can never get rid of it. Now, something changed for you, though. And, and tell us about that, and then we'll get to your meeting with Bill. Sure. And... I was a complete narcissist. I lived by media attention, anything that I could get to, for, to build my notoriety, and I didn't think or care about anyone else other than myself until the day that my daughter was born. We have a picture of that here, actually. And there I am, 
in the delivery room and this little baby girl gets handed to me, you know, and she's got her little scrunchy face and, and I look into her eyes as they open for the first time and I know that her brain, the first picture she's going to take is my face. And up until that point, I believed I was going to be dead or in jail by the age of 30 as part of a white revolution. But now that statement didn't make as much sense. And I started to think about someone else other than myself for the very first time. And it wasn't an overnight transformation. It was a, a, a thawing process because I was so emotionally disconnected. I was operating from my ego, from, from all up here, and the ego takes you to some strange places when it's untethered and disconnected from the heart. And a child is safe to love. And for the first time, I could allow the guard to come down. I could allow myself to be vulnerable because a child is not capable of shaming or ridiculing or rejection, at least not till they're about 12 or 13. <laughs> Then they get really good at it. Then right. they get really good at it. But, you know, what? it, it, it was a, a thawing process, and it was really, really powerful. I became a single parent of two children, and I had a son 15 months, uh, 15 months later. And, and um, you know, as a single father, uh, you know, having to make, you know, what I, how I justified it to myself leaving the movement, the rationalization uh, was, because was, my income was being affected, who my children could play with at school were affected. Everything about the quality of their life was affected. And so the way I rationalized it to myself to keep that identity alive was to say, why, why should I be like Don Quixote jousting windmills, fighting for the, a bunch of white people who couldn't care whether I lived or died? If I'm going to be a true warrior for the white race, I'll make sure these two children thrive and survive. And that's how, it, that's how that journey started. But... Um, you know, it was so much of my identity, I had to keep that identity portion alive. And that's how I rationalized it. Hmm. But as I became a single father, and I started to get attention and acceptance and approval in very healthy ways, because I tell you, it's not fair. As, as, a, as a single father, I got, it was like the, the blind person that can suddenly see. Like, I'm not supposed to be able to take care of children, right? It's, it's <laughs> like, oh my God, you're a single father, that's so fantastic. It's, uh, I wouldn't have got the same... Uh, respect and such that, that, a, that a woman gets. Uh -huh. It's a very different experience. But it, it was able to substitute those things that were missing in me before in a, in a healthy way rather than an unhealthy way, and I just allowed that to happen. But as you say, it, it didn't totally remove your sense of the, the white supremacy piece. It just was no longer profitable, sustainable to stay within the movement and raise your children. Right. So I, as as I left the movement and the associations and, and that behind, uh, a, pro, a process we call disengagement, um, I still had the ideology and the beliefs. And um, the, the psychic bonds to it mm. start to weaken. The, the relevance, the importance, you know, it was the number one thing in my life for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Then it was number two, then number three, then number four, and other things started to, to fill my life. But I still, the identity part of my ego wanted to, to hold right. on to that, even though I had a Chinese business partner and I was going to do business in China and many different things. And I left in about 1998, and I didn't, run into Dove until about 2005. Mm. And so talk about that, that meeting with Dove, and, and maybe Dove, you want to chime in here. H how did you meet Tony? And, and tell us a little bit about your background, too, because I, I, I'm not sure everybody knows uh, sure. who you are and what you do. Well, we actually met through Damien, who's here tonight, who was a mutual friend, and he brought Tony to uh, one of my public workshops I am a leadership speaker. I speak all over the world. And I used to own a seminar, some public seminar company. We put on these live events, public events, uh, like that one there. And people would. It's come. a nice suit, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and so Damien had brought Tony along to one of those. And it was a, I think it was a three day weekend, right? 
he came to that, and you know, Tony seemed to have a good time. I didn't know any background on Tony at that time, and I believe Damien gave you a gift of uh, an appointment with me. Is that right? Yeah, for my birthday, he gave me an introductory one-on-one <laughs> yeah, one count. present. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's also known as a punch in the head. <laughs> I also didn't have any background on you. <laughs> no, he had no, and he had no background on me either. So he, 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 he walks in my office, and, and I work with a, a wide range of very successful individuals in a whole variety of different backgrounds. Dove's an, an author as well. He's got many books and publications. And stuff. Yeah, so I seven or eight books. I was cited by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers in the world. I also run a podcast that's the number one podcast for leadership from Inc. Magazine. So there's all kinds of different things. But uh, like these people come to see me, I work with, I'm very direct. I, I'm, I'm known for being direct. There's people in the audience who will testify to that. Uh, but it, it's, but I, I believe very much in, a, in, a, in being direct and not not BSing, but also with deep levels of compassion. And Tony came in my office, and he, I'm asking him about who he is and what he is, but I can sort of get this, I get this sense of him maneuvering around things. So I just leaned forward, and I said, spit it out. And he goes, what? I said, Whatever it is you're not saying, just say it. It's okay. I promise you, it's okay. And, you know, Tony swallows a couple of golf balls <laughs> and finally leans in and then starts to tell me about his background in the neo-Nazi movement. And the more he's telling me, the bigger I'm smiling. And he's telling me more and I'm smiling some more, which of course is not your typical reaction you would get for that, right? <laughs> I was rather confused by it. <laughs> it was my first time of counseling uh, or any type of uh, thing like that, and I, I certainly wasn't expecting that response. No, it's, you know, it's, it's probably like, mm, tell me more. <laughs> but instead, I just began to smile. My smile just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and, and he finally got a bit pissed off, right? He got a little upset and said, why are you smiling? What's funny? And I said, you do know I'm a Jew, right? <laughs> <laughs> and your response... Well, of course, right? The, the irony, yeah, the was, irony of it. And was that your response? Was of course? In, inside. Inside. Yeah, not yeah. outside. Oh, okay. Not no, outside. No. <laughs> the, the, the outside, I've, I had a few colorful terms. You know, but it, it was, um, uh, you know, it was kind of gobsmacked. And, and so here's this man who loves me because yeah, we got to know each other. Um, wants to help me, wants to heal me, and here I am, someone who had advocated for the annihilation of him and his people. Is that true, Dove? I mean, in that moment, you had no animosity as you heard what Tony had done to, you know, to the Jewish community, to our people? Yeah, it, it's interesting. Uh, my original training way back was as a counselor and a therapist, and Part of the training was that you were not supposed to feel emotionally connected or to get too emotionally involved with your clients, you know, to keep this separateness. And that never worked for me. I never believed in that. Uh, M. Scott Peck wrote a book called The Road Less Traveled, and he was a military psychiatrist. And in that book, he said, he said, if I don't love my, my patient, I can't help them. Mm. That love is the healing process. And that, for me, resonated. That was like 82, 1982, and it was like, that was what it was. And so my principle was that I can't work with anybody if I don't fall in love with them. Not in a romantic sense, but I need to deeply care about them. And so when he first told me that, of course, I don't have that connection to him. But I do have a, a philosophy and to this day. And it's this, that nobody sits in front of me who isn't me. Hmm. So in our conversation, yeah, the neo-Nazi stuff was there. Yeah, all those things you just talked about. But there was more, and I wasn't willing to see him as simply a neo-Nazi. So we recently, last year, this time last year actually, we both spoke uh, for the United Nations and State Department in New York together on this subject. And, um, and we were asked the same question, and they said they were talking about de-radicalization. And, and they asked Tony, did, did Dobbs speak about de-radicalization? like, no, of course not. 
Mm. And he, they said, what did you speak about initially and what did you say? Monty Python. Monty Python. Like yeah. we talked about Monty Python. We talked about Monty Python because what it was was to look for the rapport, to mm -hmm. look for the commonality, to look for what is not different but rather the same between us. And so I didn't have that resentment or animosity or any of those things, even though my my bubba um, was paranoid about the Nazis and you know and ingrained that into me as a little boy, that never sat with me. I, I did see Tony as a human being. And I always had this principle, and it comes back to what Tony said. Here's what I believe. I believe that on the day you were born, each one of us, Tony, every neo-Nazi, Donald Trump, <laughs> even him, on the day we were born, somebody been a doctor, might have been somebody held you, and you're probably the length of their arm, and their head, your head was in their hand, and as they looked at you, they saw you as a miracle, just the way Tony looked at his daughter, and saw her as whole and complete and nothing missing, and I believe that with all of my heart and my soul, that we are whole. And yes, life happens and we forget that. But if we can remember that about, if we forget it about ourselves, but we can remember it about the person in front of us, we can remember that they were a miracle, born a miracle, that they are already whole, then the behavior has got nothing to do with who they are at their soul level. Mm. And that is how I operated. Not because I'm better than anybody else, but because I had suffered. I had had the snot kicked out of me for being a Jew. I lived in a ghetto area in Northern England. And I'd watched racism at every possible turn around me. Fortunately, I had a mother who taught me not to be racist. But I suffered it. But I, I always saw that the person doing it, was not, that wasn't the truth. Mm. And I always wanted to find out what was the truth. Because I could see that those behaviors are catalyzed by something, and I wanted to help find that something and peel it away. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, within a very short period of time, as Tony said, you know, I, we became friends. I, I began to love him and care about him and care about his mom and his family and his kids and, and got to know them all. And so it was from that. So, so Tony, was that, because when you were meeting with Dove, you were still, though not actively involved in the movement, you were still holding on to you know, a lot of the, the tenets and, and, and the, the perspective. Um, so what was it that, that, that started to peel that away for you? I think one of the things that, uh, you know, this, Dolph was asked this question in, in New York, who was the Tony that walked into your office? And, and seven years had passed since I'd, I'd left. And while it was, um, yeah, maybe the best way I could put this is the answer was, Tony had left the movement, but the movement hadn't left him. Mm -hmm. And so there was residual stuff. It didn't play any importance in my life, but there was still residue left over inside. And, and that's what I needed the help of, of someone like Dov to, to help me work through and remove and, and clean out. So, so tell, me, tell us about that. How did you begin to, to clean that out? How did you begin to remove uh, those feelings, those thoughts, those, those, those hatreds? Well, I think the, this is what I, I truly believe, that the level to which we dehumanize other human beings is a mere reflection of how internally disconnected and dehumanized we are inside. So the answer isn't to go and, and address line by line the ideology um, because the challenge is ideology and identity, uh, as I knew, were intertwined. The challenge is to, is to heal the person. And so it was about making that journey back to connect with my heart. Because once I could connect to my heart and see my own humanity, then I could see and recognize it in other human beings. And that it may seem counterintuitive, but that, that was the trick that... When I came into this world as little Tony, 
you know, is this bright, curious, mischievous, defiant, stubborn. <laughs> My mom right there will, will, will tell you that. <laughs> um, but I wasn't a neo-Nazi. Mm -hmm. You know, somewhere along the, the way life happens and, and we make uh, choices because of that. I don't ever blame anything on my childhood. I'm not, I'm not a, the victim here, right? I was a perpetrator. Um, but things that happened in my childhood changed the decisions um, or affected the decisions that I made. And the, the example I use is, you ever gone to the grocery store when you're really hungry? And you notice how you, you make unhealthy choices. As a young man, I went out in the world emotionally hungry and I made those poor choices. So I, I chose everything I chose to do. Mm -hmm. But the journey back to, to the heart. And when we're compassionate with someone, when Dob was compassionate with me in the office, when my children, who didn't know anything better than to be a total compassionate mm -hmm. with me, and my mom, who never gave up on me, even though you know, I was an a-hole, um, what they do with that compassion is they hold a mirror up and they allow someone to see their humanity re reflected back at them when they're not capable of recognizing it or seeing it within themselves. Mm. And it was, um, you know, I always talk about three, the three main sources of, of compassion in my life were my children, my mother, and, and Dov. And they helped me find my way back to connecting with my humanity. Wow. Wow. I mean, Dove, it really seems to me that you modeled for Tony what he had been missing so much, uh, you know, had received from his mom and from his children, but, but, but not from the movement. Um, you talked a little bit when we were talking before of this about how this was a transformative process for you also, that you learned some new things about yourself. You talked about shame, and, and can you tell us a little bit about some of the insights that you got from this work? Yeah, I think that, as I said, nobody sits in front of me who isn't me. Yeah. So, you know, having to look at, well, how, I, you know, I, I had to ask, well, how have I shamed others? Mm. How have I humiliated people? How have I done that? And, you know, a lot of the process work that I do with people is um, always about vulnerability. So if I can't, I can't serve you if I'm better than you. I just don't believe that for a moment. The only way I can serve you is for you to see me in you and for, you to, for me to see you. And so we need, you know, that reciprocity and vulnerability. And one of the things that happened was that um, I pushed, <laughs> I didn't nudge, <laughs> I pushed hard for Tony to take his message to the world, mm. to share his story. And, you know, I would get yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> and then <laughs> it would like be that nervous laugh and then try and get away. And then um, I said, no, you really need to write about this and you need to speak about it. And eventually Tony said, will you teach me to speak? Because I said I speak. So, and I was too busy and said no. And he eventually put this speaking program together. We're teaching people to speak. And Tony was in the very first version of that. And we went through this process, and this was transformative for you, right? Um, and I'll let you tell that part of, of how it transformed you, but one of the things I deeply believe is that forgiveness, we do it with the cup, not the heart, and we need to do it with the heart. We, we think forgiveness, and, and this may, may again seem counterintuitive, but part of my work with Tony came from the work that I'd done on myself, and that was that you can't actually forgive anyone else until you forgive yourself. Mm. And I had to forgive myself for things that I'd done in my life that I felt horrible shame about. But there's something called healthy shame. Healthy shame is where I shame, I'm shameful of it. And so I make myself a promise not to do it again, which is different than guilt. I right. feel bad and then I get over the guilt and I can right. do it again. But healthy shame is a promise you make to yourself. And it's done with your own heart. And so in our, in our work together during this particular training, I'd asked Tony to share a story as part of what everybody had to do in that training was to share, share a shame story. And 
Yeah, share that story a bit, Tony, with the rocks, <laughs> because the rocks and the pebbles. Because it's nothing to do with Judaism, right. but it's everything to do with what was driving. So we, there was a group of us, and... Uh, this is well, back when you were in the movement. About 17. No, no. This, this is, is this probably is, before. Oh, before. You're kind of right on the edge. Okay. Um, we, we, we were skinheads, but not so much political, and, and we were down by the Aquatic Center, which was a place where um, gay men used to go cruising. And we chased this young gay man into a construction site, and he went into a darkened crawl space that maybe was about that high so that we couldn't get at him. And, you know, he went deep into the, to the darkness, and we were like kids at the, at the lake in the summer. And we picked up stones, and we whistled them into the darkness. And you'd hear clack, 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 clack. And every third or fourth one, you'd hear clack, clack, ah! As that person screamed out in, in pain. And, um, you know, and I, I try to think of what was going through his mind. And I, I'd been in situations myself where I knew something really bad was about to happen to me. And there was nothing I could do about it. I remember feeling myself uh, feeling absolutely powerless in a certain situation when that bad thing was going to happen to me, and not being able to do it. And here I was putting that person into that exact same space. You know, what we don't transform, we transmit. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, we got bored after five or ten minutes and then, you know, went away to go do something else. It was this total detachment. And I... I it's... So he had to stand up and tell the room this while we're in this training. Mm. And he did. He told that story. And I said, okay, now do it again. But feel it. Because he told it very narratively. You know, and it was obviously emotionally withdrawn again, head not heart. And I said, try it again. And it went on for about... Two hours? Two hours. <laughs> So a short story that probably took maybe three minutes to tell went for two hours. Was like, do it again. Do it again. Until he could feel his own pain. Until he could feel his own pain. And the final thing that shifted it was when I said, now tell the story this time as if you're the gay guy hiding in the dark. Mm. And that was when it broke down. That was when he had to come to his own forgiveness because we went to him narrating, doing, shifting to being the, this young gay man, and then shifting to a, a third position. And the third position was for him to be sort of hovering above and wondering why mm -hmm. each of these people is behaving this way. Mm -hmm. Why is this gay man hiding? Mm -hmm. And why is this other man so angry? that he has to throw stones into the darkness. And Tony broke down and cried. And everybody in the room broke down and cried. We all wept. And it was an amazing healing process mm -hmm. because it was the beginning of truly where Tony could forgive himself so that he could actually move forward and ask for forgiveness. Mm. And, and you did that. You, you went from somewhere around that time to starting to, to seek out individuals either you had harmed or a representative of you had harmed. You told me a story about a party that you went to where there were some gay men at the party. Yeah, that was three, three weeks after. <laughs> so it wasn't, I didn't wait too long. <laughs> Pretty fresh. <laughs> yeah, and it was Ron. I was at the St. Patrick's Day party and there was four gay men at the party. Everyone else was pretty much straight and, and I asked them if I could have uh, a moment of their time. And I pulled them into an empty room, and I told them what I had done. And I asked if, if they could forgive me. I have no right to demand forgiveness or expect forgiveness. But what I said to them was, I know I didn't do it to you, but somebody else has. I know I didn't do it to you, 
but I did it to your community. And uh, I was bawling. They were bawling. And, and three, three of them could forgive me. One of them couldn't. And I, I get that. That's, it, that's just where, where he's at. And like I said, I don't have any right to expect or, mm-hmm. or, or demand. What I was able to do was to, to put myself in that space where they could also forgive. You know, and I, I realized it was a very powerful experience, and I'm still good friends with a couple of a couple of them. They were at my tiki party last week. You had a tiki party? Yeah, without the torches. There was no torches. <laughs> I'm glad you made yeah. that joke, and I didn't. <laughs> hey, you want to make sure the lights are different, right? <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. Seven foot tiki and everything. Right. Else. Okay. Um, but I. I what I saw and, and discussing it with them after in, in dialogue was how powerful and important it was for them mm-hmm. to acknowledge their pain, you know, to, uh, for someone to say sorry for the, for the pain, that, even though I hadn't caused it. And, and I, it was, I know how powerful it was for me, but I was also able to witness how powerful it was for them. So, Part of why we're here tonight is, is the, this Jewish commandment, uh, the obligation to do this process called tshuva, um, which we translate imperfectly as repentance, but it really is return and repair. And there's a multi-step process to it, and you've walked through a couple of those steps already. You've acknowledged what you've done. In this instance, you sought forgiveness from people that you had harmed or represent for those people that you had harmed. There's another step in the process, and that really leads us to what you're doing now in your life, which is we have to repair the wrong that we've done. And sometimes that repair is is elusive. There there are things that that can't be repaired. There are things like, you know, that that we could spend our lives trying to bring back, but we won't. Um, But you taking Dove's direction to, to speak about this and to do something about this, you went another step beyond just asking for, not that there's a just with that, but beyond asking for forgiveness. So... If you can share with us what you're doing now. Well, currently I'm a co-founder and a board chair of an organization based in Chicago called Life, Life After Hate. It's founded by six members of the violent American far-right white supremacist movement um, and Canadian. Um, and what we do is uh, we try to help people who are where we once were. So we help people leave white supremacist and neo-Nazi uh, groups. We help uh, get them out, and we help them on the journey to rediscover their humanity mm. in much the same way that someone did that for me. Can you tell us a little bit about, because it's been in the news a lot lately, and we had, there was a rally you know, downtown at, at City Hall, not so much downtown, but at City Hall. Can you tell us a bit about the, state, the status of the white supremacist movement here in Vancouver now? And sure. Well, across Canada, I think there was a recent report that said there's 100 groups, 100 different groups. And uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center has the United States at 900 and something groups. And I think when you look at, at the populations of the two countries, that's proportionally, I think, just about bang on the same. So we, I know we like to think that those values aren't the same here in Canada, but um, they show up in the same proportion here as they do in, in the United States. Mm-hmm. And, Dove, have you done any, beyond Tony, I mean, have you been involved in this? Uh, uh, on, only in that we both spoke together, like I said, at the UN last mm-hmm. year about this, and, and it was interesting because a lot of the focus was, of course, on um, extreme Muslim terrorists and and we were the only ones talking about the right wing and of course you know we've and we we spoke about uh, we actually did a, a a live broadcast from New York together on a rooftop and talked about how the candidates at that time because it wasn't sorted out yet the, the candidates were underestimating the right wing mm. and they were underestimating how important it was for us to to address this that hate is very real and that 
people who feel marginalized will bring will feel hate. We need someone to blame, and, and this is part of the human psyche, and we've got to understand that. And you know, you and I were having a discussion in the office before um, that a big piece of, of what's important to me is the humanizing of people. We tend to dehumanize. And may I just say what we were saying? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. In February uh, of this year, I was honored to be asked to speak in Iran. I spoke in Iran at the World Business Forum in Iran um, to 900, uh, 500 uh, CEOs and C-suite individuals. And everybody was like, oh, are you okay? You know, you're going to be okay. You know, don't, you know, be careful. And I was I was not concerned anyway, but when I got there, the people were wonderful. They were beautiful. They were incredibly welcoming and caring and loving, and, and the audience was at least 40% women. So all the ideas you get from the media about how women are treated there, just not generally true. Most of the women had blonde hair, their hair was dyed, and yeah, they had a shmata over their head, but. You know, it wasn't a hijab or anything. There were some women with hijabs, but not many. Um, the women were highly educated, master's degree at least. Um, they were all incredibly welcoming. And one of the examples, I want to give you two quick examples. One of the examples was that uh, we were in a, we went to the oldest restaurant in the bazaar in Tehran. And we were taken there by a, a girl who worked for the company who, who we brought us in to speak. And we were three of us speakers who went for this, this lunch. And it's this cram-packed place. You can barely move to get in. And we get in, and we're sort of standing there like sardines. And everybody treats us like royalty. And we're clearly not Iranian. One of the guys is a six-foot-two, white, thin English banker. And he looks like a white, thin English banker. So clearly not, nothing looking him Iranian. And, um, and the girl who's with us says, what would you like to eat? And of course, we're looking at a, a menu that's in Farsi. We don't know. <laughs> so he said, we don't know. So he looks at this lady who's close by, and he says, what's she eating? So our guide girl says, she asked the lady. The lady takes her spoon and puts food on her spoon from her own plate and gives it to the white Englishman from her own plate. Then later, a few minutes later, we're seated, we sit down, and I happen to be sitting at the head of the table, and the lady is sitting over there. She gets up to leave. And as she gets up to leave, she puts her hand on her heart. And she says, thank you for visiting my country. You are welcome here. Iran welcomes you. And smiles at me and leaves. I don't get that when I walk into a place in the US or in Canada. Just a weird thing. Another example, I'm sitting in the hotel on, on that same morning, actually, sitting in the hotel having breakfast, and I'm waiting for other people to come. And I'm just, as you do, people watching. And over here is three guys. One guy's about 60 years, uh, two guys about 60 years old, one guy about mid-40s, about 40-ish. And they're all sitting around, they're talking Farsi, and all of a sudden a woman walks in. And she's in the traditional full hijab, full black, full length, everything. And we've all heard the media tell us how these women are treated by men. So we've all got the conditioning in our head. And I'm a pretty liberal guy, and I travel all around the world, and I've got people from, friends from every possible nation I, I can think of, but I've still got that, that stuff still leaked into my brain too. And this lady walks in, and as she walks in, these three men stand up, pull out their chairs, and welcome her. They all honor her. She sits down, and I continue watching. I said to the rabbi, I got a little verklempt. <laughs> and he got up. The young man got up a few minutes later to go get some more food. And on his way back, I called him over. And I said, do you speak English? And he said a little. He spoke pretty good English. And I said to him, I told him what happened. I said, it really, it really hit me. And he said, he just looked at me and went, of course. In other words, that's how I treat women. It was another example of how we are told who people are, and we fail to see who people are. 
we get a conditioning about people are. So we look at the neo-Nazis, we look at Charlottesville, we look at those places, and we see angry young men. But we don't see people. We don't see their hearts and their souls, and we don't see the pain they're in that has them in that march. We forget to see the humanity. When I came back from Iran, I wrote an article that went actually quite viral and it was called The Twelve Myths About Iran. And when I was asked about why did I write it, I said, because I have a responsibility as an international speaker to humanize. Because as Tony said, the easiest way to damage other people is to dehumanize them. And we need to remember that. Because every one of us, I mean, you're talking about the time of year we're at in, in the Jewish calendar. But every one of us has done things that are pretty shameful. Every one of us, even the most wonderful of us, can look back and go, wish I hadn't have done that or been that way. And when you look back on those things, are, they, are the things you did a reflection of who you are? Or are they a reflection of certain set of circumstances? Or are they true to your soul? And invariably, it's not true to who you are. Yeah. And we need to remember that. That's part of the forgiveness, is that everybody's just a mirror. We don't live in the world, we live in the mirror. And we need to look at people in that way and notice that what's going on is simply a reaction. But the truth is something else altogether. So that thing has continued on. It's taken different forms. Dove, thank you for that. It, 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 it mirrors something that I've learned in my you know, 17 years, almost 18 years in the rabbinate, which is that, well, there's a theology out there that says everything happens for a reason. It's been my experience more that there's a reason for everything that happens. And that everything has a backstory, and that when we when, when we get to that backstory, when we start to understand the person behind the anger, the hate, you know, uh, you know, all of those things, then then we get to the humanness, and then we can start to get to repair. I want to thank that's you. That's what Life After Hate is doing. Yeah. I just want to point that out. That's what Tony's group is doing. They're taking these people who are angry and hateful and all those things and looking underneath, and and making changes in hundreds and thousands of people around the world. The hardest thing in the world to do is to have compassion for someone who has no compassion. Mm. But aren't they the ones that need it the most? Yeah, they really are. I want to thank you both so much for this. Um, really, let, let's, well, we're going to take questions, but please, a, a round of applause. Thank you. I, um, so I'm going to ask Rabbi Brown to, to come up and take Tony's mic. I think I've got the other one working here now. Um, and we'll open it up to questions, and if somebody will turn the air conditioning on, we'll be all happier, too. First question, does it have to schwitz in here? Right. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Tony, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm interested in how your interactions occur. Do you approach people to, in the white supremacist movement? Do they approach you? And are you or do you feel you are in danger at all when you do this? Um, so can you guys hear me OK? Yeah. OK, so there, when dealing with someone, there's often uh, the, there's an opening w where they want to leave. I mean, we, we, don't, we can't go and take someone who's solidly entrenched and has no desire to leave, to leave. Um, so there's already that kernel of o opportunity, and they're reaching out, uh, reaching out to us. What started last year during the election cycle, though, was I guess as people became more aware of who we are and what we were doing, um, we're getting a lot of parents. We get a lot of um, you know, brother, sister, friend, a lot of uh, those type of requests. And those are much more difficult um, to deal with. I think, um, you know, there was, to give you an idea of what's going on out there, the, there was a woman uh, who wrote us a letter, mother. She said, my son's 18 and he has Asperger's syndrome. And he's up to his eyeballs in this white nationalist stuff. I'm not, you know, I don't know what to, what to do. And she said, what really scares her is that that community, the white nationalist community, has embraced and accepted her son in a way that no one in his life ever has before. And so at, at that point, you're dealing with really deep psychological drivers. And I would be willing to bet that that child would believe anything in order to get that acceptance and approval. And so it's, it can be tricky. Do I just push your mic up a little bit? Cool. 
I might have missed something because we came in a few minutes late, but did you talk about how you got to be a neo-Nazi? Neo you did, at the beginning? Okay. Briefly, I, yeah. Okay. And then I also wondered why you chose Dove to go to, and what, what, what prompted you to go to him in the first place? Well, on the, on the surface of that, um, I didn't choose Dove. You know, it was, I went to a personal, you know, public growth, a personal growth workshop, public workshop, and we just happened to hit it off. He liked Monty Python, I like Monty Python, and he, he's from <laughs> Manchester. It all comes back to Monty Python. It all, you know, when you get two English expats, you know, they, they nerd over all things kind of weird and British. Um, and we just bonded. And I had no idea he was, he was Jewish, and we just really hit it off. And when Damien gave me that gift certificate, um, I had no idea what I was walking into and what that appointment would do for the, you know, to, ch to alter the tra trajectory of my life. Yeah, is that good? Yeah. Yeah, um, my question is, uh, the is, uh, subject matter is vengeance, and in particular, I'd like to know uh, what role vengeance plays in life after hate, and also, if you could address, is there a, a satisfaction to be had uh, through vengeance as a response to hatred? Well, uh, the, the mission statement of Life After Hate is to inspire individuals to a place of compassion and forgiveness for themselves and for, for all people. I don't know in Life After Hate that there is a place for, for vengeance uh, in, in our philosophy. Um, we, don't, we don't go out and seek vengeance or anything like that. What we do is promote uh, compassion and forgiveness um, so that we we give up that anger that's inside us. Um, I, I was a student in Madison, Wisconsin uh, in the late 80s and the neo-Nazis were coming to campus and I was in a, a lecture hall with a professor of uh, History named George Mossy, who is a Holocaust survivor and a renowned historian, and also uh, suffered some for being gay and being Jewish. And he talked a lot about compassion. But then the neo Nazis came to town, and people said, How do you think we should respond to this? And this was a question that was posed to him. And, he, you know, the, the idea of showing compassion to those who need pa compassion, I get, but at the same time, you have to be in dialogue with that person in order to have that occur. And I remember Professor Mossy saying, you know, these folks out there at this point in time, they only understand one thing, and that's bats on their heads. Um, because he felt under, th under threat, and he wasn't going to have dialogue at that point. It's similar to the idea that, you know, what this gay person that was being, rocks were being thrown at them at that point in time, and that person can't have open up dialogue with you, right? Uh, they need to defend or run or attack or something. So. I, I want to get to my question is, if, you're, if you actually are under threat and you're in danger as a Jew to neo-Nazis, is compassion actually a realistic response? And I can ask that to either of you. So where, where compassion often falls down? Um, and I think it's misunderstood, is, is when it's not accompanied by healthy boundaries and consequences. So there's going to be neo-Nazis that don't want to change, not going to receive your compassion, um, but the law needs to deal with They need to be held accountable for their actions anyways. It doesn't mean we don't hold people accountable. It doesn't mean that you don't defend yourself. It doesn't mean that you don't defend your neighbor when, when they're under attack. Um, but it by healthy boundaries and consequences. Otherwise, it's, it's too one-sided. Yeah, I'm going to give you my mic. 
So, so I want to I want to further answer that, if I may, because Tony's touched in on it. I think that with 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 any of these terms, whether we're talking empathy or compassion or forgiveness, we often like to do this mass generalization of something, and and, and it's nothing is that way. Everything is on an individual basis. So as a mass generalized term, this is all about compassion, absolutely. But in an individual situation, you have to take care of yourself. Of course you do. Um, understanding that, though, it is as we become a healthier society, and you know we're seeing some unhealthy things right now, we, are, we have to become healthier, as Tony mentioned, this is you know, part of the whole principle of what in our work is healthy boundaries with healthy consequences. So boundaries are not rules, boundaries are clear. So there's a boundary, uh, you may have noticed on Oak Street, that if you drive at 50 kilometers an hour, that's the boundary. I don't know how many of you drive at 50 kilometers an hour, but I personally don't. Um, and if I don't, and the police come, I get a ticket. That's a consequence. So there's a boundary and a consequence. A rule would be you can't ever drive again. It's just like it's done. So healthy people don't have rules. They have boundaries. And they have consequences for those boundaries, and they're willing to enforce those. And if somebody repeatedly breaks the boundary, then the consequence gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Do we need to take bats to the heads of the people who have bats? No, I personally don't believe that for a moment. I think the Antifa movement is a very scary movement that I'm seeing that's coming from the left in response to the crazy right. You know, violence begets violence. And do I think we need to be a pushover? No, it's gonna be very difficult to push somebody like me over. But at the same time, am I gonna, re am I gonna respond to to violence with violence, no. So we've got to be strong and rock solid in being compassionate to where it doesn't seem to be deserved, in being willing to see that there's somebody below the movement, somebody within that, that there's something deeper in a human being than their hate or their rage, which, by the way, they may not be able to see yet. See, I was fortunate, and like Tony said when he was asked over here, well, are you in danger when you're helping these people? No, because there's that kernel of that they want to get out. And I was fortunate in working with Tony in that he was out of the movement, even if the movement wasn't fully out of him. There was that kernel of something saying, this is not right. And each of us in our own lives can look at our own lives in that way and say, I've got the big house, I've got the nice car, I've got the right things, yet something's not right, something's missing. And some will say, that's, that's a sham. Some will say that's our soul calling. Some will say that that's something deep within us. But that thing is the thing that I talked about in that baby that is miraculous, that doesn't go away. Like he said about his daughter, she wasn't born a neo-Nazi. She was born to a neo-Nazi father. But that wasn't who she was, and he didn't want that for her. He wanted to nurture that part of her that was whole. And that is... That, please understand, this is not easy. I'm not telling you this is easy. Wave the forgiveness wand. Wave the compassion wand. I'm not saying it's easy at all. Not for a moment. I've got anger just like anybody else. And I want to get angry at these things and do get angry at these things. But what I have to remember is there's something below the rage. There's something below the ideology. There is a humanity there is a spark of soul. And yeah, that calls us to be bigger. It called Gandhi to create a peaceful movement in India against the violence of the British. It called Martin Luther King to make the civil rights movement a peaceful movement. And yeah, Malcolm X went the other way and did the violence. Did they both make a difference? I think they did. But I think we're always called to choose how we deal with it. Mm. It mirrors this morning's Torah portion. We're reading in the, in the Bible, in the Torah, the, the very last bit of Deuteronomy, a portion that we'll read again on Yom Kippur, and, and 
the, the message of the Parsha is a, is a temnit savim, that you stand before God and you have a choice to make. You can choose to, to follow in the ways of God or you can choose not to. And, and to choose to follow in those ways of, 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 of seeing the compassion and the, and the humanness in others, of seeing people, even those that, that, that are hard to see in that way, as B'Tselem Elohim is being created in God's image, is to choose life. And the other way is really a path towards destruction. Not necessarily at God's hand, but at your own, because you'll live a life that is rudderless and that will be you know, grasping for things that are, that are fleeting. Um, but I already gave, I'll give a sermon in a couple of days. So. <laughs> <laughs> but at a simple level, it's the choice between fear mm -hmm. or love. Yeah. Another question here. Oh, sure. Well, uh, I mean, if, if I'm getting you, uh, I mean, having Tony here, it, it helps separate uh, ideologies and movements from people. I hate the ide ideology, hate the movement, but there's the human. Absolutely. And, and they're, they're, they're two different things. And uh, I think. often I, hard to separate. This helps. Good. This, th th this helps. When, uh, and, and correct, help me, Tony, with the timeline. So I, I coached Tony's son for six years, and he played minor hockey for me, and then he followed me to my high school, and we, I think we, we had a pretty good relationship, and good relationship. Tony was an extremely supportive parent. So, and, uh, and our sons played, and I know I've always had mezuzahs on my door. So in 2004, probably, when we met, uh, where were you in your uh, continuum of, of healing? So I was just at the beginning of meeting Dov, which is 2005. You guys can hear me? Yeah. It's just, it's hidden behind your cone. It's having all sorts of microphones around. There you go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so... <coughs> That was very much after, you know, uh, 2004, I think, I began my spiritual journey. Um, my introduction to spirituality and to meditation was a 10-day Vipassana silent meditation retreat. I never meditated before that. It's kind of in the 10 days of no reading, no writing, no talking. Um, so that wasn't a, a, a part of who, who I was, and, and I know know, the way I related to you and your, and your children and everything, it clearly wasn't uh, a, a part of that. So that was right at the Genesis 2004, uh, when I was just about to meet Dov. I wanted to ask you, Tony, how big is the movement? You, you, the life after hate, you mentioned that there were 900 uh, groups in the U.S. that were white supremacists. Uh, are there enough? Uh, is yours the only group? Are there more groups? And my second question related to that is how, do, how does the financing of organizations like yours goes? How, how do you raise funds to be able to accomplish your mission? Like any, any, any organization needs some sort of financing. Well, I think as far as the size of the movement, I think it's bigger now than it has ever been. The white supremacist movement? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't call this a movement, I just call it. Right, that's an organization, but the white supremacy movement. The microphone works great for me. I don't know what Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, I don't, I don't sp talk loud enough, but I think it's, the size of the, the whole alt-right, that whole spectrum, I think is, is much larger um, now. The, the groups may be about the same, but there's, there's the online technology, which what it, what it does is it lowers the bar to entry. So back in the 80s and 90s, you would have to go to a public meeting somewhere and, and there'd be the, the, you'd risk violence, you'd risk being identified by the police. There was, other, there was there's an anonymity that, to the internet which allows people to tiptoe their way into it uh, at, a, at a much lower threshold. I think the other dangerous thing is that um, instead of waiting for a book to come through mail order and then ordering another book to come through mail order, you can consume the information at the rate that you can consume it and that you can uh, radicalize, like in the case of Dylan Roof, 
who started off with the question about um, black on white crime. Um, and then you can go right down the rabbit hole. And if you want to spend 24 seven for a month consuming that information, you can do that. You couldn't do that before. The, the internet has opened up the anonymity and the flow of information so you can radicalize in weeks and months, not months and years. Mm. Right, okay, so for Life After Hate, we were six years old now. We started as a nonprofit in 2011. Uh, we were awarded a, a grant by the Department of Homeland Security under the Obama administration for $400,000, and that would have allowed us to use Facebook and internet to um, an algorithm that would identify who's radicalized and radicalizing and actually reach out to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, when Trump got elected, he froze those funds, and mm. in June, you know, just weeks before Charlottesville, uh, you know, six weeks or whatever, um, they they pulled the they pulled the funding for for us. They gave really? it to the, <laughs> every, everyone else, sort of else, um, but us. Uh, but in an amazing turn of events, you know, the the timing of Charlottesville and everything, um, we've raised today. Today we hit the hundred percent of our four hundred thousand dollar target. Really. Um, to our public wow. Other questions? Tom's got one here. Tony. Um, hi, thank you very much for coming and sharing. Uh, you just touched on what I was going to ask, actually, and that is the current situation, you know, that we all watched um, happen over the last year and a little prior to it, thinking that this would never happen, that people who have so much hated them would never be allowed to be so public and to be so verbal and to be standing up receiving so much, many accusations. So, like I have my own personal plan of how I hope to deal that, with that within my own circle. It sounds like you're working on it, but what, what can we do? Because it's not just anti-Semitism and it's not just hate towards blacks. It's, it's very subtle racism that we all get away with at times. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, I think if you're going to, if you're going to deal with that, the, that subtle racism, um, I think, again, we don't have to tolerate it when we hear it. We, get, we don't have to be the bystander. We can speak up. Now, you don't have to be super aggressive when you can speak when you speak up you can um, you know when we found with Twitter you know we did uh, Yale did some experiments with Twitter and they went out to find people that were saying nasty stuff on, on Twitter and these Twitter bots would say hey do you understand that's a human being on the other, other end of that comment mm. and when they targeted people with that Twitter bot uh, I think over a three month period the amount of dehumanizing tweets the targets did went down and I think sometimes you just have to relate it to, to the person in a, in a human experience. If you get, confront them and get all in their face, I think you risk further, further polarizing them. But there's, there's, um, you know, there's, the, there's the structural racism, there's the, the subtle racism of white privilege, and then there's, there's the overt racism of, of the white nationalist movement. And there's, there's differences there. I think I was talking to someone the other day that you got in the White House, um, white supremacists don't call themselves white supremacists, but they have all the power. Mm -hmm. And then you've got these people that call themselves white supremacists and have none of the power. And every now and again, this group uses this group to, to, to get things done, but there, there's two d different, um, different beasts to, to deal with, because I think the group that has all, all the power, they, they're equal opportunity um, Offenders. Haters. They, they, yeah. They'll screw everybody. <laughs> Great. This sort of relates to that one, and it's a little difficult to unpack, but there's 900 groups in the States. There's 100 in Canada. Donald Trump did us a favor in a bizarre way without intending to do so. He allowed the hatred that always existed right below the surface of political correctness 
to rise to the surface because the most powerful man in the country now could call people the most horrific things and keep his job, and in fact get the best job. A place where if anyone else applied for a job and walked into the interview and said those things about someone who worked in that office, they would have been escorted from the building. So now those people have come up and normal, nice, regular people who you never would have thought would say hateful, horrid things do. I believe that exists in my country on exactly the same level. That all the nice people who have nice, clean thoughts, who would never think of saying those things, actually believe them. I know there are people that work in my office who say hi to me every morning, don't like Jews. They never tell me they don't like Jews, but they don't like Jews. And when I put something up, they give me the look. So you're in a unique position to answer a question for me. When you were young, and you have your mom here, who gave you a loving household, and you had those things, what could someone else have done for you that would have stopped you from making that decision? Because I know I've made poor decisions and got to places in my life I wish I'd never got because I made the bad decision and then it was impossible to get out of it. You got there, you've got out, but what could have changed your mind and what can we do to change the minds of the nice normal people from happy households we interact with every day so they never get to where you get and had to get out of? Well, I think this, the secret is in it's not about the mind. Right? The, the people, like I said before, the level to which we dehumanize others is a reflection of how dehumanized we are inside. And um, there's a great book that I read, I recommend, Healing the Shame That Binds You by John Bradshaw. Um, and it's this toxic shame that we pick up along the way that it tells us where we tell ourselves that we're not good enough at a deep subconscious level. Toxic shame is the root of all violence. It's the root of all addiction, and I believe it to be the root of all uh, extremism, white, white supremacy, all of, all of that type of thing. So we're not dealing with changing the mind. We have to change the heart. And um, I'm not entirely sure what I would have said to myself then, but it would have been directed at, at the heart and at the shame and, and at the, the feelings that I was feeling, not at the head and what I was thinking. If, if I may, um, there are certain things that exist in human beings that are not religious or cultural, they're human. And every human being has a set of specific needs that they have to have met psychologically. Those needs are universal. And if those needs are not met in a healthy way, they will be met in an unhealthy way because we attribute them to our survival. So one of those needs is the need for significance. Every single one of us has that need for significance. When it becomes massive, then you know, we have become narcissistic and egoic, and you know, it's all about look at me. And the interesting thing about that is, the more insignificant a person feels, the bigger their demand for significance will be. Mm. So Tony's behavior, while in the movement, as he said, he, you know, he said he behaved like a, like a complete crazy person, everything to get the attention, because he felt insignificant. So one of the ways around this is when you see that behavior, is to give significance in a different way. Uh, I, one of my students for years was a dog trainer, and he was in my trainings for years, and he said, oh my God, I know this stuff. I get it. And I go, yeah, I bet you do. I go, it's like training dogs, isn't it? And I go, it's absolutely like training dogs. <laughs> Reward the behavior you want, and yes, you have to create consequences for behavior you don't want, but you put far more emphasis on the behavior you do want. Significance is a massive issue. You know. Why is ISIS grown so big? Because it's in the news every day. So I'm this lost kid who lives somewhere and has got some kind of grudge and I'm upset about certain things, and I see that ISIS will welcome me. Well, they'll make me a hero. 
If you really want to understand this, it's about significance. So if you want to make that shift, give person significance. One of the ways to give them significance is to do one of the other needs. Every human being needs to belong. Every human being, even the most antisocial person needs to belong. So make somebody welcome. Bring them in. I grew up in Lubavitch. And I never wore the uniform. Didn't look the part. But I went to Lubavitch. That was my, that was my shul. And I was never, ever ridiculed for the fact that I had hair that was down to here. I had big earrings. I wore crazy clothing. I was never ridiculed, and I always felt welcomed. And as a result, I could go, and I could get into great, deep, Kabbalistic conversations with Rebbas, and have all these fabulous conversations, and be welcomed into their homes, and never felt like I was an outsider. So how could I... I couldn't say anything against them. Now, I know, by the way, Jews are racist. I don't know if you've noticed that. You notice that? Yeah, we can be racist too. You don't, you don't get a pass on racism because you're a Jew. Right? So we can be racist too. So this is the thing is to understand that sometimes our history makes us racist. My grandmother said my bubba was very racist against Germans. Now some would say that was justifiable because of her age, but she was racist. You know, she said you can come home with anybody. Come home with, uh, her words, come home with a Schwarz, but not a German. You know, that's the racism. So how do, we, how do we deal with it? Give people significance and give it to them in love. Make them a member of the community. If you want to understand addiction, I'll just explain addiction to you at the simplest level. Everything we know about addiction is wrong, has been proven wrong. How do we know? We think you'd shoot up heroin, you become a heroin addict. Well, if that's true, how come your granny went into the hospital, had a hip replacement, and they gave her the best heroin in the world, Far better than anything she could buy on the street. She was, on the, she was whacked out of her brain for a couple of weeks, came out, and went back to normal. Because surely, if you get the hit, you're, you're hooked, right? No. What we know now, biologically, neurologically, is that addiction is about lack of community. This, de -ra this radicalized behavior is simply looking for a community. When Tony talked about this, this kid with Asperger's, he just wants to belong. When Tony went into that movement, he went into a movement that said, yes, we welcome your anger. We welcome your rage. And what's more, we'll give you tons of significance about it, right? Absolutely. We talked lots about that. And when we look at the, the young men that were arrested in Brussels and Paris for the ISIS attacks, we look at them and they're not, they're not students of the Quran. You know, they're, they're scholarly look at the Quran did not lead them to ISIS. They were troubled kids. That's mm -hmm. it. They had criminal histories and drug histories. We're all looking to be loved. We're all looking to belong. We're all looking to have somebody see us as significant. And if you can remember that, like before we jump into compassion and empathy and all those things, this is, you know, like I said, those are grand ideas. And yeah, we want to get to that. But this is where you start. Everybody you meet is fighting a battle. Everybody you meet is in a battle. And when we remember that, that's when we can have a little bit of question. And part of it is saying what they really want is they want significance, they want to belong. How can I help them belong? How can I give them significance? That's how we change these people. Yeah. And it's it, a it, beautiful, yeah, totally. If, if loneliness and shame uh, are the root causes of it, then isolation and shame aren't the answer. It just further in, entrenches them. Absolutely. And, Dove, that's what you did for Tony. And, Tony, that's what you're doing with all of the people that you and your organization are encountering in Life After Hate. And it's the message that our tradition teaches us time and again, that human beings are not only born but Selim Elohim, but they're born Kadai. They're born worthy. They're born worthy of the, of the greatness of the possibility that exists within human beings. And when we take that away from somebody, when we see them as an it and not a thou, when we see them as a thing and not a human being, then we 
participate in radicalizing them. We, we push them away. And in your opening up your heart, and in you opening up your heart, you've helped heal the world in a little way that's becoming actually a big way. Thank you both very much for tonight. Thank you all. be here uh, for a little bit. We're going to have an ONA reception in our social hall. This evening was recorded and it'll be up on our website and on our YouTube channel probably by tomorrow. I really encourage you to share it because the message is so important. Uh, and we'll be here with your friends and with your family. Uh, just, we'll, be, uh, we'll be gathering for about half an hour and then at 10 o'clock will be our Sleep Hope service. That service runs for about an hour or so. so it's a late evening, but I hope that you'll stay for it as we begin to put into action and reflection. The, the, the words and the love that was shared here on the Bima. Thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs>